from SAP Law. Hemant, please. Thank you. Uh, good morning, co-chairs, uh, Professor Vitit and uh, Chris, uh, if I may refer to you as the teacher. <laughs> uh, and, uh, good morning, everybody. Uh, it's indeed a pleasure to be here amongst all of you. And as Brianna, you mentioned uh, yesterday that you were standing between the delegates and the, and the coffee break. Today, I have to uh, repeat the same expression that I am also standing between a coffee break and uh, all of you. But there is a famous expression that there is always a gap between cup and sip. And <laughs> let me be that gap today. And mind it, I said cup and sip, not cup and lip. <laughs> well, uh, as you all know that I'm a lawyer by profession and I represent SARC Law, a body of lawyers, as its secretary general. And many a times, you know, when I uh, address events, conferences, etc. I put a question, how can you tell whether a lawyer is speaking lies? And uniformly, answer comes from all directions when the lips are moving. So well, my lips are also going to move today, but uh, I assure you that, that, that I won't be telling lies because all my lies end in the courtroom. Uh, the moment you exit the premise of the court, you're, you're not allowed to speak lies. Lies are only meant for courtrooms. <laughs> well, let me give you a brief background or a backdrop about Sark Law because this is Sark Law's first interaction with many of you, though we have been associated with the, all the UN institutions for quite some time. Sark Law was uh, established in 1991 in Sri Lanka, and it comprises of eight member nations from South Asia. I need not mention those countries you would know. The constituents of SARC law are judges, lawyers, law teachers, academicians, law officers of the government, and people who have expressed interest in the development of law. It's a very uncomplicated constitution which SARC law embodies. It has two objectives. First being getting the legal fraternity of the region together so that uh, they can develop cooperation, understanding, and exchange ideas. And second objective, the most important, being using law as an instrument, as a catalyst for social change. We are not a human rights organization per se. We deal with every facet of law, be it commercial, corporate, economic laws, social laws, civil laws, insolvency laws, and human rights laws as well. And let me confess that until 2011, we were, in terms of human rights I'm talking because this forum is uh, more directed towards that particular branch of law. As human rights practitioners, we were primarily focusing on child rights and women rights, ending violence against children or perhaps child labor laws, revamping, or rights of women. It was in 2011 that we were introduced to UN AIDS by SARC Secretariat, pursuant to their guidelines. In fact, there, uh, Professor Vitit, let me uh, share with you that uh, on the SOGI resolutions, you know, the three uh, countries were part of that scheme of voting, uh, India, Pakistan, and Maldives. Pakistan, Maldives voted against the resolution and India abstained. So abstaining also means neither here or there. So that is also as good or as bad as voting against. But if you were to see the guidelines of SARC, which is driven by India, Pakistan, Maldives and other countries, Nepal, Bangladesh, the guidelines actually talk about protection of LGBT rights. So they don't practice what they preach. Somebody has to educate our sovereigns that please don't sign on dotted lines when you don't know the intent of the document. I think somebody need to embarrass them uh, through media or perhaps through some workshop or seminar. Once we were introduced to UN AIDS, we 
signed MOU with UNAIDS, UNDP, ADB, IDLO. And predominantly, the focus was response to HIV AIDS in the region. What were the barriers, legal or policy barriers, and how they were impacting the LGBT rights. They were needing a partner, a legal partner for the SAC region, and they found legal partner in us. And I think we came up to their expectations to the, to the maximum, I would say, because in last four to five years, we have had several events, projects, studies, all are uploaded on our website, where we steered many uh, initiatives uh, in the interest of HIV AIDS and LGBT rights. And here I would also like to share with you a very practical sort of point of view which exists in, in this in context of SAC region that parliamentarians in this region have always failed their electorate. They have legislated only to meet their selfish interests. Never ever they have legislated to protect the rights of LGBT. So therefore left with no option, SAC law started leaning on the judiciary. We devised our annual conferences in such a way that it coincided with SARC Chief Justices Conference. We ensured that all the Chief Justices of eight nations were present, not on the dais, but in the audience, to listen to the uh, sentiments of the marginalized or the, uh, uh, let me say, uh, vulnerable sort of uh, group. And why we did so? Because there is one good sort of uh, movement which is happening in South Asia that judges are legislating now in a way. Although the lawmaking power vests with parliamentarians, but through declaratory orders, they have started passing uh, laws in a way. And this 377 clarification, which was issued by the Delhi High Court, had an effect of a law because you basically created a proviso under Section 377 by way of which you excluded a particular segment uh, of individuals from the purview of Section 377, and which was very doable because day in, day out, courts are passing judgments which have the effect of law. So we clinged on with the judiciary and we started influencing their mindset in a way that they started passing <laughs> verdicts uh, which they gathered from the deliberations of SAC law. So we, we will definitely take credit of that. And the interesting feature was that the case, whether pertained to that point or not, they would somewhere in their observations try to get in the content of the deliberation which they picked up in our conferences and workshops and <coughs> seminars. So therefore, this orientation of judiciary became very relevant for us. And with all due respect to National Human Rights Commissions, they are absolutely fundamental for our society and for protection of LGBT rights. But at the same time, it is very important to involve constitutional courts because human rights are part of fundamental rights and fundamental rights are enshrined in constitution which can be protected more effectively by the higher judiciary. The judiciary I mean to say writ courts or constitutional courts. And there have been many occasions where UNAIDS and UNDP have invited sitting judges who were earlier quite uh, uh, skeptical about attending these open events, but they have been attending, sitting judges have been attending because we have nominated several judges on, on, on uh, their round tables where they have come, they have expressed, they have, they have aired their views very openly with regard to LGBT rights. Uh, I'll just take a couple of more minutes. Uh, how SAC law became relevant was that, you know, our office bearers are quite a powerful lobby. You know, they have been former ministers or future ministers. They are members of parliament. We have sitting judges. Our president by convention is, is always a Supreme Court judge or a chief justice. We have had several chief justices as our president. And the current president is also the senior most puny judge of the Nepal Supreme Court. And uh, if all goes well, he is likely to be the next Chief Justice as well. The erstwhile President was Chief Justice of Bhutan, 
who, who took amazing initiative with regard to LGBT rights. And we must admit that South Asia had a taboo about this, these expressions, LGBT. But we were able to make inroads into their minds and hearts and spirits so that they at least became open. And that's how this 377 order came by Delhi High Court. And if Supreme Court overruled that, believe me, Prof. Professor Vithit, it was because of case badly presented before Supreme Court. Because the focus of the lawyers of LGBT was, you know on what? That sexual orientation is immutable, which, it, which is not, which is incorrect. And secondly, the focus was too much on sex. Well, a relationship between man and man or woman and woman is much beyond sex. The lawyer was actually wanting Supreme Court to draft an operating manual for how to conduct sex amongst LGBT community. You can't expect Supreme Court judge to, to, to give you a judgment with regard to uh, operating manual as to, what you have, as to what you have to do within the four corners of your room. The argument should have confined to only one line which Professor Vithith has beautifully written in the forward to the regional report of uh, uh, the NHRI's, you know, it's, it's a beautiful expression. He has said that uh, they wish to be what they are. Just this one line should have been focused during the argument that you can't expect a person to be otherwise which he is not or she is not. So uh, an approach should have been taken with regard to a human rights angle rather than 377 focused carnal intercourse against the order of nature, it is not. I mean, it completely deviated the judge. And he thought that it's more of a lust-oriented petition <laughs> rather than uh, a genuine uh, sort of uh, 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 you know, argument with regard to a relationship, with regard to a person who or she, what she is, or what they, they wish to be. It's a matter of choice. So you cannot, impo you cannot sort of uh, uh, convert somebody uh, by, by way of a judicial order. So, I mean, that, that, that's what I felt, you know, because I went through the judgment. And, and, but then don't take this judgment as a negative judgment because it's a, it's a hundred page document which sums up the entire argument of anti-LGBT lobby. So you don't have to look at any other document, just look at this judgment and demolish it by carrying out a campaign with regard to, by, by you know, perhaps an event of, of, of this sort, because each of the expression of, of that judgment is objectionable because of he saying that sex and food is within the domain of sovereign, you can regulate it, which is absolutely ridiculous. And the, then the judge uh, goes on to say that this Western thinking cannot be transplanted into uh, the South Asian thinking. Why? We are living in a global village. I mean, I don't consider myself an Indian because uh, uh, at the drop of hat, I could travel any part of the world. So we, 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 on one hand, we are moving towards globalization. And on the other hand, we are saying that, you know, uh, this is West ideology. This is North ideology. This is South ideology or this is ideology of, of, the, of the South Asia. So the, the judgment was quite primitive and backward looking, uh, uh, but I won't blame judges to that extent because the, the, the arguments weren't carried forward uh, so beautifully. Uh, let me close uh, my uh, uh, address uh, by referring to uh, William Douglas J., uh, Supreme Court Judge of United States uh, of 20th century. He said that to, to look for uh, static security in, in law or elsewhere is absolutely misplaced and misfounded. The security in today's context lies in constant change. You have to get out of age old ideas. You have to move on. You have to adapt old ideas to a newer development. That's what, you know, I, I mean, these were few sort of uh, uh, views of mine or thoughts I wanted to share with you. Uh, Sarklaw website, you must visit uh, uh, and, and my email ID is also there, so if you would need any sort of assistance from my side, uh, I would be more than happy to come forward. Thank you so much. Thanks.
thank you very much, Hermant, and thank you to all of those who contributed. Um, clearly, we won't have time for discussion. Um, a